So greetings everyone and welcome to the first of the, I guess we call this the spring series of History Bite. I, it's, you know, it's not snowing today, so we're partway towards spring. I'm Gigi Barnhill, um, I'm a board member of the Historical Society and I want to thank George Naughton for arranging the season's programs and he's come up with some really amazing topics and I think today is a wonderful um, beginning to the History Bite series. Our speaker today is Marjorie Seneschal, the Louise Wolfe Kahn Professor Emerita in Mathematics and the History of Science and Technology Emerita at Smith College. That is the longest title I've ever seen <laughs> after anyone's name. Uh, our speaker grew up in Lexington, Kentucky and received a BS uh, from the University of Chicago and her graduate degrees from the Illinois Institute of Technology, all in mathematics baffles me that anyone can do that. <laughs> Although retired now, uh, Marjorie remains active in her fields of interest, and she's editor-in-chief of the International Quarterly Journal, The Mathematical Intelligencer. Her most recent books were published in 2013, and they include um, Shaping Space, Exploring Polyhedra in Nature, Art, and the Geometrical Imagination, and I Died for Beauty, Dorothy Rinch and the Cultures of Science, which is the topic of today's talk. Um, Dorothy Rinch uh, actually held research positions at Smith. Mm -hmm. I had to look up a little bit about our yeah. subject today. So I think it's particularly uh, terrific that you can speak about her and, and have such a close relationship to her. So right, let's go and thank you. welcome to uh, Uh, it's a real pleasure to talk about Dorothy. I knew her very well and in the last years of her life. And um, she lived in Amherst for a long time. And that under circumstances that I'll explain. And <clears throat> anyway, she's a fascinating character. And some of you here I know knew her. Um, and others, if you don't, didn't. And But uh, all of you, please stop me at any time with any comments, questions. Remarks, uh, hoots, boots, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. So I want this to be a discussion and not a lecture. So uh, the title here is The Protein War. And what you see here is Dorothy Rinch, who you see here. She was at that time in her mid-40s, I think. And uh, it was soon after she moved to America. She was British. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, and this is her model of a protein. And if any of you have seen any pictures, I'll show you some, of protein molecules, you'll know they don't look like this. Uh, but she thought they did. Uh, but she was the very pers first person to have any idea that proteins had a structure and that there was a molecule to be, be deciphered. Uh, before that, people had thought first that they were just colloids, which meant just a lot of atoms that were sort of jumbled together. Then they just realized they, they were molecules, but no one had a clue as to what they were like. And she's the first word person to come up with a model that actually answered a lot of the questions that were being asked at that time, experimental facts or so-called facts and so forth. Um, and this is the same model. This model is made of metal. This one's made out of, I don't know what, paper, I think. And this one was made for her uh, by the physicist Neil Bohr, Niels Bohr, and he was one of her supporters. She had a lot of enemies, and she had a lot of supporters. Niels Bohr was on her side in this, in this war. and. Uh, this photograph was taken, I think, in his in his lab also. I actually have one of these. She gave it to me. And uh, there are a few more in her papers in her collection at Smith. And what you see here, it's important to realize, is a lantern slide. Um, she did she all her work, uh, much of her work, you can see the pictures of it, the illustrations of it on lantern slides, which is how she gave what she gave lectures with in those days. And lantern slides with photograph uh, between two plates of glass and then taped together around the edges. And this was a predecessor to the road, you know, to the uh, <coughs> to, to the predecessor to the predecessor of predecessor to to, uh, <laughs> to PowerPoint. Uh, so they had these enormous, enormous uh, um, projectors, and these things were in there, and they had to do them by hand. And, um, but anyway, this is her this is her lantern slide of her of this. Um, so let me go on. So. Uh, just a little bit about what the problem was at the time. They were trying to understand not only what the what the structure was, but how the structure worked and what it, if, how it did 
what it's supposed to do. And one of the things that protein, protein do is they fold and they unfold. And if you follow any of the scientific discover, uh, controversies, now you realize that protein folding is still on, not well understood, how protein folds up and unfolds. Um, so one thing that happens if you drop an egg uh, in, uh, in boiling water, you know that it becomes hard boiled. And what's happening is the egg white is turned into, congealing into a solid white mass. And that is a protein that has been unfolded. It's in natural state. It's folded up and it's unfolded. Um, and so, but it does, this one does not go backwards. You can't reverse that, that operation. But in some proteins, you can. They go back and forth. And that was the question that everyone was on everybody's mind. Um, and that was the question she was trying to answer. And uh, she was a mathematician, um, not, a, not a biologist. And her, uh, we'll see that she was the first joint appointment here to Amherst Smith in the Holyoke College. Uh, and here she is arriving at Smith. <laughs> about 1941, and I have asked in the archives and everywhere, nobody has a clue what Smithmobile was. <laughs> and nobody knows who's driving her, <laughs> or who's being here, but this you can recognize as the alumni house at Smith. And here is Dorothy leaning out with her gloved hands, and this is perfect. So anyway, uh, someone identified the car, I forgot. The name. I don't know what it's, so that's what 1941. But anyway, she did what she, and this is 25 years later. This is what she looked like when I knew her. And this is she working with, with students. Um, and then she died in 1976. So this would be the late 60s, I think. Um, so the question was uh, what protein molecules look like and how do we know? But she didn't start with that question. Uh, I'll come, I'm sorry, just show you another picture. Um, this was. This is her model again that I showed you before. This is what it really looks like. And between there is 30 years. And those 30 years were the war. Um, and she was at the real forefront of all of this. She was in all the newspapers. She was written up. She was considered to be you know, a great genius. And here is this I got from Rockefeller Foundation Archives. A uh, woman, Einstein. And uh, what's important, she's a fulcrum of exciting battle in science. That comes from here. I believe she's taken the first steps toward discovering the secrets of the structure of protein molecules. Others, great scientists agree with her, others say poo poo. And a lot of scientists were furious that she got so much publicity. Um, <laughs> and that is something that hasn't changed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Marjorie, do you imagine that they were furious because she was getting publicity or because she was a woman getting publicity or both? Both. <laughs> both, absolutely both. Do you think uh, she got the publicity because she was a woman? Uh, no. But I think it didn't hurt. I mean, it made it all more dramatic. But it wasn't, it wasn't just that. That's I mean, Dorothy Ridge, let me say one thing about the woman question, because it comes up all the time with her. Um, there were other women doing, working in the same field. They had, they knew their place. And if a, <laughs> if a senior scientist said to them, you were wrong, they would say, oh, thank you very much. I will go back to my lab and make the corrections. Dorothy said, go hell. <laughs> <laughs> so he really did not appreciate that she didn't take criticism very well, uh, and she was and she was usually often right. You know, in, I mean, the criticism was very often wrong, but she didn't take it gracefully. She she didn't fulfill the role that they expected a woman to do. So first of all, there weren't many women in science, but those who were were supposed to behave in certain ways, and she didn't do that. Uh, so it, it's a complicated story. It's not just that she was a woman, but also pe anybody given this kind of publicity is enough to send a lot of people off the wall, whether man or woman. That sounds a bit like Einstein, doesn't it? What? Einstein didn't take criticism very well. well uh, <laughs> a lot of people. And <laughs> 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 one of the funniest characters, this is nothing, not really involved here, but the philosopher Karl Popper, who was famous for criticism as the growth of science, and they wrote a whole book on criticism. He couldn't take it either. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, scientific <laughs> method is one thing in theory, quite another thing in practice. And, uh, so here we go back to the beginning. So she, uh, she was born in Argentina, actually, in 1894. And her parents were British, and they were working. A lot of British were in Argentina at the time, running this or that. And her father was a waterworks engineer, running water systems. And uh, when she was three years old, they came back. She was the first child, and they came back 
uh, to England and settled in Surbiton, where he he controlled. He was the director of the waterworks there for most of London. And uh, <coughs> she went to a, a school called Surbiton High School, even though what, it wasn't what we think of as a high school. It started in kindergarten and went through 12. And uh, the thing to remember about it, this is a picture of her that we found there when we, my husband and I went to see the school. And there's, I asked if you had any, any records of her, any knowledge of her. No, we never heard of her. And then we look on the wall, and there's a port, you know, pictures from the old days, and there she is. So <laughs> there's unmistakably Dorothy uh, right there. But they didn't have, this isn't dated, but I think it's about uh, 19 too. And Serpent in High School was a uh, very good school uh, run by a very modern teacher, but it was also very, very, very Anglican, and the, uh, the, the um, headmistress's duty was not only teach them uh, the, <coughs> you know, the, the, the uh, subject matter, but also to instill feel fear of hellfire in them, which she was very good at. And so they were all terrorized by her. Um, just the sight of her walking down the hall was enough to send them all into a tizzy. They'd written, they wrote reminiscences of this one. Um, but uh, anyway, there she is at that age. Uh, but this same headmistress was a passionate uh, suffragist. And she, uh, her sister, in fact, had landed in jail for the, being part of the, um, uh, the mass demonstration in which the suffragists smashed uh, uh, buildings and things in, in, in London. And this is her sister. That this, is the suffer this is the headmistress, Alice uh, 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 Proctor. And her sister wrote a book about her own experiences. And she says, I heard the clock strike six, and immediately afterwards there sounded the crash with shattered glass from the direction of the Cunard Company's office, and I hastily turned the corner and swung my hammer against several of the small panes of an old-fashioned silversmith shop. And she was then hauled off to jail. And an uh, uncle, and these were all well-connected people, and she had an uncle who was a, a lawyer. He came to help her, and she told her to go away. She said she was proud to be in jail. And so that meant the whole school was galvanized uh, to bringing flowers and fruit and everything to the, to the suffragists in jail. So that's part of Dorothy's background and part of her termination uh, came from that. <coughs> uh, then she went to Girton College in Cambridge, which was one of the two women's colleges uh, at the time. And she went to study math. And uh, there she is. They all dressed like that in 1913. Um, and she finished with very high honors at, at Cambridge. Although at that time they didn't recognize, even Cambridge didn't recognize the women's colleges, so she didn't get an official degree from Cambridge University because the women's colleges weren't recognized as part of the university. But they were nevertheless allowed to take the exams and so forth. So she did that. And then she decided, uh, she had to decide what to do. And there weren't many options open to her, and certainly not many jobs or anything like that. And she decided just to keep on studying. And she was very interested in Bertrand Russell, a uh, philosopher, uh, partly because he, she was interested in his philosophy, but partly because he was uh, a radical ad activist against World War I, and she was, she was too. And uh, also, he was a committed atheist, and she enjoyed that. She'd been raised in this Anglican uh, setting. And he told the students at Cambridge that, uh, who were used to examining exams where it would say, do any six of these problems. And he said, mm -hmm. now think of the Ten Commandments like that. Any six you <laughs> <laughs> It's up to take your pick. <laughs> Only six need be attempted. That's what he told them. So they love that. So anyway, she, uh, by, he had been kicked out of Cambridge University by then for his anti-war activities. But she asked him if she could study privately. And he took her on, along with several other students. Um, and she studied in London with him. And her work is still cited um, mm -hmm. by logicians. When I was writing about her, people were getting in touch with me saying, oh, I know her as a logician. And she, her work prefigured this and prefigured that. She didn't stay in logic. She moved on. She did this all the time until she got into <laughs> business. Before that, she was moving from field to field. Uh, she joined the Aristotelian Society, which is still going strong, and lectured there. Um, she received a Master of Science and Doctor of Science at the University of London. And then she was the first woman to ever receive a Doctor of Science from Oxford. And all of this in mathematics in that period there. And that, in that period also she you know, married another mathematician and they had a child. Um, and then she got interested, <coughs> fairly long story which we don't have time for here, but she got interested in biological problems. Um, this was a time of just right after the, the war, the First World War, uh, where the Rockefeller Foundation and other groups were urging uh, physicists and mathematicians to take a look at biology as a field that their insights could be useful, they thought. 
And biologists themselves were feeling too that they'd spent too much time classifying things and uh, doing genealogical trees. They needed to understand basic processes and basic, basic theory. Uh, and so various groups formed, and she joined this one, uh, she helped to found it, called the Theoretical Biology Club, which is still considered very important today to getting, uh, being the founders of molecular biology. And there she is with people whose names you may not know, but anyway, J.B. Bernal and Joseph Needham, who later went to China and became a historian of science in China, and his wife, and uh, here's Conrad Waddington and so on. But the main question that they were trying to answer is, what is the relation between those large particles, which we call elephant trees or men, and those extremely small ones we call molecules or electrons? And they wanted to understand this chain of, of structure. And at what point do the molecules and electrons group themselves into something that's alive? That's the question we still don't know the answer and it's still one they were trying to do. So she worked on that for a while. She worked with them and she um, made an effort to uh, explain chromosomes, to have the structure of chromosomes. And she had, there were some errors in there, but she had some insights at the time that were very valuable and became part of molecular biology. And the Rockefeller Foundation um, got excited about her work and gave her a five-year grant. She didn't even have to apply for it. Was she an independent scholar all this time, or did yeah. she have an academic No, she didn't. She didn't. Uh, there was no academic position for her, and what there for, for anyone, or even for maybe the man, they would get fellowships here or there. And she would get fellowships. She had one from Girton College, she had another one from somewhere else, and, and then she got this. But uh, the reason that they noticed her was that the whole group, the Theoretical Biology Club, had applied to Rockefeller for a uh, an institute, interdisciplinary institute where they could work together. And Rockefeller looked and said, we don't do buildings, we do brains. And they looked to see who had the brains. And they figured she did, so that's, they <laughs> gave it to her. Um, and so she got the five-year grant to apply mathematics to biology. And at that time, um, people were just beginning to be interested in proteins because it was realized that first of all, they're very important, they knew their biological importance, and secondly, they realized they were molecules. And that they're molecules, then they have a shape and a size, and you should be able to tell where the atoms are and how they interact and what happens. And nobody had a clue to that. And so what shapes and sizes? And so this is the way that uh, the people thought at the time, but they didn't have any proof, and now they do have proof, that actually the proteins are very long chains that fold up. And they can fold up into what they used to call globular, meaning to some sort of round shape. Um, and then under heating or whatever uh, um, whatever you do to them called denaturation, that, uh, they unfold into a long chain and then they can refold back up to the way they came. And uh, this is the way it's understood today. Uh, but nobody knew where the atoms were, where the, where the different uh, amino acids, where everything was in here. This was all a complete mystery. And Dorothy, uh, <coughs> uh, so before I get to Dorothy, she did. Uh, this is a picture of, them of the egg whites, which I mentioned before. Um, so this is the folded state, this is the unfolded state. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but Dorothy said that they're not long chains. This was her idea. She said that everything told her, all the facts that she knew of, suggested that they're not long chains. They may start that way, but then they don't fold up into balls first. They first fold into rings. And the rings then make a sort of lacy fabric. And so this can continue out. You can see there's a sort of hexagonal thing here, and then it goes out and out and out. And this beautiful, beautiful lacy pattern. And she said, then that is what folds. And that folds up like origami. So we know with origami, we just take paper and we fold it up and make a beautiful thing. She said, that's what happens here, too. So it's not a chain folding up. It's a piece of lace folding up. Uh, and this is her idea. So this is the picture I showed you before. And this is the unfolded piece of it with these same things moved around and you can see that this then you just fold it along these dotted lines uh, and it folds up. And that's very easy. I can make you one of these in two minutes. <laughs> but the question was, how does nature do it? Mm -hmm. And why would nature choose to cut it off like this and to make it fold along those lines? And she couldn't answer that. Nobody could. Uh, so this is a hypothesis, but only a hypothesis. And so um, anyway, this is, this is the unfolded state of that. And this is, I said, was made by Niels Bohr. And her model implied that proteins, uh, see, she could do this in many different sizes. So you could take a bigger piece and fold it up and get a bigger one, or a little piece and get a little one. And she showed you could make 
several different ones. We also more made these for two different sizes. This is the one that, you, that I showed you before. Here's a smaller one, even smaller. Here's a bigger one. And that seemed to fit the facts because of the facts, they, as they had them in, they thought the proteins came into a number of weight classes. So they were this size or this size or this size or this size, not a continuous range. And some, whatever theory you had had to explain that. And her theory did explain that. Uh, it turns out not true that they fall into these weight classes, but that was the experimental data at the time. We have to always remember that the data, the, ex the experimental facts can change as more you have better instruments, better technology to find out. But we, everybody believed that. At this time, you mentioned amino acids. Did yeah. they know that amino acids were part of the study? Yes, they did. They did. Okay. they did. And part of the discussion and debate about her is where are they on here? Mm -hmm. You know, because they were hanging out or hanging in, or where where were they? Um, this was supposed to be not, this wasn't everything, this was sort of like the skeleton. And then amino acids and so on were tucked in uh, somehow inside there. So she had a lot, this really caused a big uproar. And um, she had supporters, lots of them, uh, because they saw the possibilities. If she's right, then we could have designer drugs. Now how does that happen? Well, you have this lovely little skeletal shape and you can attach things to it. And they knew how to do that. So they could have designer drugs, that, which we now do have. Uh, protein folding, it seemed to explain that. It explained the molecular weight. And so people, these were all Nobel Prize winners who were saying these things. Uh, then you also had Nobel Prize winners complaining, saying this was nonsense. Because there wasn't room, the atoms were overlapping, the amino acids would be too crowded if they were on the inside. If they were on the outside, where were they going? Hanging out there like what? Uh, and then also the, to make those, those loops, those rings, required that there be a chemical bond, which nobody had ever heard of before. And she claimed that it must exist, and that's why it does that. And other opponents, including foremost Linus Pauling, who was the leading chemist of the time, said there's no such bond, there's no possibility of such a bond. And so this, is, this was what the battle was about. There were people seeing all kinds of things. The glory of geometry, notice that's geometry, it's math that some, from so few principles, so much can be derived. All these wonderful things will happen if she's right. And they're saying, but she's not right. So this, is, this was the battle, and it raged on and on and on. Um, here, uh, this is from the Rockefeller Archives. Warren Weaver was the head of the, uh, <coughs> the um, Natural Science Division of the Rockefeller Foundation. And he quoted, uh, this is in his own uh, memoirs, he quoted two, two uh, people talking about her within the same week. Um, this is somebody else, I don't know who it was, I forgot who it was, a British uh, chemist. He said, I was calling on Pauling at Ithaca. He was in bed with a cold and the Commonwealth fellow from Oxford was also calling on him. Uh, that's the one I meant. When Dorothy Rich's name uh, was mentioned, he, that's the Oxford guy, blushed furiously and had to draw on the deepest reserves of the English character <laughs> to keep from being profane <laughs> in Mrs. Pauling's presence. <laughs> Concerning what the Oxford chemistry colleagues were. <laughs> so, then, oh and then, uh, then, but the other side of the story, and this is what uh, we were going on. On the other hand, I was talking to Yuri, who had won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1934, and commenting on a woman in his laboratory, he said that she was seemingly good, but of course not Dorothy Rich. And when I asked him what he meant by that, he said, well, I mean, of course, she isn't an outstanding genius. Going on to explain that he supposed there could be no serious difference of opinion that that is what Dorothy really is. So he seems a really difference of opinion. This was, uh, um, and she was nominated for a Nobel Prize by another Nobel Prize winner, Irving Langmuir, uh, in 1939. She didn't get it, but she was nominated, and he was one of her staunchest supporters throughout this. And this is the picture that uh, I showed you at the very beginning of her with Keith holding that model that she had made out of paper there. So this was on and on and on, back and forth. And um, then Pauling. <laughs> In the middle of all this, Pauling wrote a uh, paper, uh, which was later called by everybody the debunking of Wrench, in which he claimed, you know, step by step, why everything she was saying was wrong. Um, and uh, Alexander Todd, one of his colleagues, said, "I must say, I derived enormous enjoyment from reading the debunking of Wrench. As far as I can see, the case is unanswerable." Uh, and everybody was laughing their heads off. Um, and uh, her daughter, they had, by that time, at the beginning of the war, World War II, she moved to the United States. She, her husband had had a mental breakdown and was hospitalized permanently. They divorced, and she um, moved to the United States with her daughter. And uh, her daughter must have been about 10, 11, or 12. And she wrote this letter to Linus Pauling, 
here, dear Dr. Pauling, your attacks on my mother have been made rather too frequently. <laughs> if you both think each other is wrong, it's best to prove it instead of uh, writing disagreeable things about each other in papers. <laughs> I, I think it's best to have it out and see which of you is really right. <laughs> Oh there, there are many quarrels in the world. Alas, don't please the not be one. It is these things that help to make the world a kingdom of misery. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. That's precious. Oh. That precious? I don't say I, Dorothy didn't send it. You know, it's it still in the papers and so oh. <laughs> But it is, isn't it precious? It just, um, uh, but anyway, if, uh, good things happen too. I mean, they moved to uh, Amherst because. A supporter of hers at Amherst College named Otto Blazer, who was a professor of biology, uh, was very excited and urged her to come to the valley and thought that she could do a lot of good here because of all the colleges here. There weren't, Hampshire didn't exist, and UMass was Mass Aggie, but there were three colleges. Mm -hmm. And he arranged a joint appointment uh, for her at all three colleges in 1940-41. And then he asked her to marry him. <laughs> and she realized this was the love of her life, and she married him. And, and uh, they did live happily, well, they lived happily, things were not always happy at all. Uh, just touch on that in a minute. But anyway, she uh, she came and they were married. This is now at the front of their house on down the street, on <coughs> South Pleasant Street here, short walk from here. Mm -hmm. And uh, she gave a, a course at all, a joint course at all three colleges. Um, she traveled to each one every week. And it was a great success. Um, but it, it was not continued because the World War II started and, it, and the, all the colleges went on war footing and they, something like this was, they just couldn't do. And most, many of the faculty had left on, uh, to work, uh, do war work and so they just, they just couldn't possibly. Uh, but Smith kept her. So of the three colleges, she was invited to stay on at Smith permanently. And it was in some sort of visiting position. It's never been clear to me exactly what it was, but it was some visiting position. And, so she commuted then, and then that's what that Smith Mobile was about. She commuted from Amherst to Smith and stayed there for the rest of her life. Um, uh, then in, by 1962, the actual structure of proteins were deciphered, and this is, uh, this first was hemoglobin, and this is model of that, and this was myoglobin, model of that, and none of them look anything like her model. And she uh, refused to even look at these. She was at a conference where these were shown, and she, we didn't go in the room with them. She was so upset. But she also <coughs> thought she was right. Uh, so why didn't, what was this about? Why was she so stubborn? Because she was stubborn. But there was more to it than just that. Uh, because her, her critics' arguments against hers were provably flawed. And, uh, and were hers were too. They were all wrong. I mean, one person who'd been through all this personally, who was part of all this, uh, Caroline Guillory, a Dutch uh, crystallographer, told me that everybody was wrong, and that's why they fought so viciously. She said, you know, when people know what they're talking about, they don't fight like this. It's just when every, you know, they're defending positions that they're unsure of themselves. So her, the arguments, including Pauling's, were wrong. Uh, but so were hers. And so that, but she knew that theirs were wrong, and so she didn't give it. And uh, as one person put it, you know, if someone holds on to an idea and everybody attacks it for years and then they prove right, you think, what a genius for holding on to it. Mm -hmm. But if someone holds on to an idea for years and years and then if you're wrong, you think, what a waste of time, what a stupid person to do this. So, you know, how do we judge with, in the middle of all this? How do you know? Um, anyway, she, uh, she knew that their arguments were wrong. And also, she was a mathematician. And she wasn't a chemist and she wasn't a biologist. And really, these, these fields, these are all called disciplines. And what are they, what does a discipline mean? It means they discipline their students to think in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And they do think differently. It's not that they can't communicate, but they, they really don't speak the same language. And that was part of her problem, because she saw everything from a mathematical point of view. And that wasn't how the kids saw it. And in particular, she saw the simplicity and beauty of her model as being a thing in favor of it, whereas they just thought that was silly. Um, so anyway, I'd like to compare this to King James. <laughs> <laughs> because he wrote a most wonderful thing called The Counterblast of Tobacco. Uh, in which he proved uh, that tobacco was bad for your health and you shouldn't smoke. And he was sending this to the colonies, he was sending it all over England, he was very upset about smoking, and he said it's bad for your health, and he was right. Okay? But why is it bad for your health? Because our health depends on the balance of the four humors, wet, dry, cold, and warm. And we have to, we're delicately set up so that the these things all balance, but when you smoke, 
you're taking in dry, hot air into your cold, wet lungs, and you're messing up the fevers and the balance, and therefore this is bad for me. So, you know, he, he, this is Pauling style. I mean, he was right, he, smoking is bad for you, but not for that reason. And the same thing would turn out to be true with Pauling's arguments against her cycle bond, her bond that she had. That he, was, he was right that about the, the proteins, but he was wrong about, uh, <coughs> about that. Uh, and it turned out, in fact, in 1951, that her structure was found. And was found uh, in, uh, which I think is perfectly wonderful, in a relative <laughs> LSD. <laughs> <laughs> but it really is there. And uh, her bond, everything. It has not been found in proteins. It never been found in proteins. And the folding up was never found. But the bond itself was found. And the, this um, uh, Arthur Stoll, who found it in his paper, he said this was, that he knew that this had credited her. He said this had been her idea. And he knew that a lot of objections had been raised to it, but nevertheless, here it is. And then cyclochemistry chemistry became a respected field of chemistry, and still is. And she was now traveling to conferences and doing, a, her life came back from that. Uh, Did she like the idea that it was not found in proteins, but was indeed found in the cell? Well, I never asked her about that, but my guess is that she would, her answer would be, it will be found in proteins. <laughs> 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 and, and you know, the, the the pro there's now a protein structure data bank with hundreds of thousands of proteins in it, and some of them are wrong. I mean, they, they actually go through looking for mistakes that were made early on in these years by people who didn't understand the structure. So, you know, who knows? But probably the event's not there, but she probably would have just said, yes, of course, it will be found. Uh, and she had modified her views, and she had made it more sophisticated and more subtle as time went on, too. Uh, so she said what she said to me. She said, first they said my structure couldn't exist. And then when it was found in nature, they said it couldn't be synthesized. And then when it was synthesized, they said it wasn't important anyway. <laughs> so, uh, but <laughs> anyhow, it was found. So I just want to end with this picture because, um, you know, this was her view. Um, the pictures I showed you before of some of the protein molecules just look like a mess. But I found in looking at them on the internet and looking for pictures of proteins that people are going out of their way to look for symmetries to look for the most beautiful way that they can be presented. And here's one. This is of the in insulin molecule. Look at that. I mean, that is, that's, you don't, it doesn't have to look like that if you look at it from some other view. It looks all garbled. But that they would choose to do this, this means that they're also driven by that same uh, desire to make things simple and to make things clear and to make them beautiful that she was. And I think that's a basic part of science. And I, um, I feel that, this Emily Dickinson's Aww. poem speaks to her situation so well. Uh, I died for beauty, but was scarce adjusted in the tomb. One who died for truth was laying in an adjoining room. Uh, he questioned softly why I failed for beauty, I replied, and I for truth. The two are one, we brethren are, he said. And so as kinsmen, men and night, we talked between the rooms until the moss had reached our lips and covered our wings. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And it was when I heard that set to music, I was at a, a, a concert of music and someone had, had was singing this. It was absolutely beautifully sung and then I thought that's the title of my book. Because I was writing a book about her. Mm -hmm. And um, I, until then I wasn't sure, I was sort of wondering around what I could call this one. But I got the beauty really just was really it. And that is what it's all about because that's what the mathematician is looking for in all this and, and so on. So that is a picture from the Smith Archives of her, and um, it's, so yes, I'd be delighted to answer questions. Or, yeah. So, <laughs> how, did, how did she and her peers and successors find the structures? I mean, it's pre-micro, oh. I mean, how do right. you... Well, that, 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 that. That's, I'm glad you asked because that ties into the story about what happened to her here at Amherst. So uh, the only way to do it was through taking crystals and uh, doing x-ray diffraction experiments with them. Mm -hmm. So a crystal um, acts as a diffraction grating for x-rays, just as you can have a diffraction grating for light and you can hold up and see the little screen and you can see the diffraction pattern. Uh, x-rays and crystals work the same way. And so what they were doing in those days, and they still do, is to find the structure of, a, of some molecule or something, is to crystallize it, mm -hmm. and then pass x-rays through it. And the x-rays can, you can't see the x-rays, 
but you can get them on a photographic plate. They will show up there. And then you look at that plate. Now it's automated, but in those days it was really hard work with the photographs and they were trying to see what the dots meant and where they were and read that backwards. And she became, that this was her post, her Amherst space, and her Amherst space, one of the world's experts on reading those backwards. Mm -hmm. And she wrote a brilliant book about that, which helped the whole field. Uh, and that had nothing to do with proteins per se, but it did help everybody in, the, in every structure analysis. Uh, unfortunately, you know, there were, this is where the prejudice against her uh, came out very strongly, but you know, her husband at that time was the head of the biology department and he was the, on the committee of six at Amherst, which is very powerful, and he was the acting president, all these kinds of things. Uh, but he had a grant from the Rock and Roll Foundation to study genetics, and he, part of it included having an assistant to help with models and things like that, and that assistant was helping her with some of this X-ray diffraction work. And when the president of Amherst found out about that, he had a fit and he fired everybody all concerned. And because um, the grant wasn't being used for exactly what it had been put down to be used for, although it was close enough. And anyway, it was, it was very sad. I mean, her husband lost his position as head of the department, and um, it was inexplicable at all. But there, I think the prejudice against her being a woman was very true. Were there anti-nepotism rules that played into that, too? Uh, no, I don't think so because that had never come up because there were no <laughs> women on the faculty at all. <laughs> so there couldn't be any nepotism laws yet. Uh, but uh, but the, they had asked before, she had been offered uh, money from the Burke Foundation, they would set up a lab for her and, and so they asked if Amherst would give them space for this and Amherst, St. President King said, no, we won't. Um, and uh, you, you can give lectures here, but you can't teach here anymore. And they didn't want women teaching. There were no other women at all, and they didn't want them. And they felt she was a troublemaker, and her reputation had followed her for being so contentious. And so she wasn't allowed to have the work lab, and she didn't have any lab, actually. But eventually at Smith, she was able to do some research work. Mm -hmm. Gladys Anslow, yeah, Nancy. So uh, did she base her structures on anything experimental, or was it just sort of a really nice mathematically nice idea that she thought should govern the structure of the protein? Uh, well, it was, it was sort of both. Um, the, the, she, did, she did admit that there were chains. Okay. And those chains were more or less what people thought they were, except that she said that then they then folded uh, up into the rings, and the rings then folded into mm -hmm. the way. So that, that idea of the fold of that bond was not originally hers either. Mm -hmm. uh, someone else had thought it up because they were trying to understand how, how does it happen that wool crimps? If you have a piece of wool and you put it in water, it shrinks up. What's going on with the molecules there? Mm -hmm. So they thought the molecules in some way getting, you know, shrinking, and some bond was, was forming there, and that was the idea. And someone heard that electron suggested her, and she said, you know, I bet that's it. I bet that's what's happening with proteins in general, and that would explain mm -hmm. the folding. So, that was coming from that, and that was F.C. Frank, who was a well-known physicist and chemist at the time. Um, so the idea was in the air, uh, but she made more use of it than anybody else had. Mm -hmm. And then her idea that you make this with this lace that folds up into these sort of origami-like things, that was all hers. Mm -hmm. so. Nice, like, nice mathematic idea. Yeah. yeah, that's where the math came yeah. in. And the simplicity mm -hmm. of it and the beauty, and also the fact that she just had this beautiful design, it looked like it was yeah. a lace. There are all those amino acids and other things that she didn't bother to account for. She knew they were there, but she figured, you put them in. Yeah. Uh, what we want, we're looking at is the overview. We want to see what's the big picture here. Yeah. X-ray crystallography is the same field that Rosalind Franklin Roughly, right? or, uh, Rosalind Franklin was just much younger, and mm -hmm. Rosalind Franklin was working with those X-ray diffraction. Yes, that so it was, it was related there, and Rosalind Franklin was was actually taking the this was DNA what she was looking at, and looking at the diffraction patterns. And if you've seen that so-called photograph 41 or whatever the mm -hmm. one, it's a big round picture with spots. That's the, exactly the X-ray uh, X-rays being caught on the photographic plate, and she was trying to work backwards. And to work backwards and figure out that that was a helix and so forth. That, that was what Rosalind Frank was trying to do. And they knew each other, uh, but they didn't particularly bond. <laughs> 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 but to, don't forget, in her own lifetime, Rosalind Franklin didn't know that she was yeah. being attacked by Watson. That was only later. Uh, 
got very young cancer. So they didn't see themselves as both beleaguered. You know. Yes, I, I love the idea that she was such a multidisciplinarian, you know, that she oh. came from this background where there had been cross um, fertilization, whatever, you know, and, and it seems that even in her marriage she must have had that at home. Did she have any other local groups that she could um, work with, or was it mostly just the appointment that she had at Smith? Well, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I mean, she was a loyal um, Amherst College wife and was in the Ladies of Amherst Club, which is, if you can't believe such things as that did. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> And she was, she was, she went to the meeting. She even gave some talks. She was one of the few who actually gave talks at it, as opposed to just listening to it. And she also played the piano. And she was um, com a company of concerts and other people. And she also was interested in art. When I came to Smith and met her, I first heard about her from somebody in the art department. I don't know how I would have met her otherwise. It was someone there who saw me looking at patterns, uh, and I was trying to understand patterns of crystals and so on. He said, "Oh, you, you know Dorothy Rich?" I said, "No." He said, "Well, you should." Because the very book that I was looking at was this huge, huge thing called Grammar Ornament, a hundred year old. Oh, that's a gorgeous yeah. book. Yeah, yeah, gorgeous book. Yeah, yeah. I was looking at that and he said, She has a copy. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so I went and I got in touch with her and asked if I could meet her. And well, anyway, make a long, long, very long story short, I have her copy now. And it's, a, it's a treasure of my life. Mm -hmm. She was very, very excited about symmetry and very excited about patterns. and. Uh, and she was very gregarious, it seemed to me. Uh, Nancy, you knew her, so it, it's me. Yeah. Did you? Vaguely, yeah. yeah. She was just there. Just there. And uh, <laughs> always some controversy around her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, when I, I, you know, I gradually learned there was controversy. She was always really nice, I found her. Extremely mm -hmm. nice. I mean, a little strict. And a little, she didn't like something, she didn't like it. She asked me to help her with a book, and she was. Not, to, not with the ideas, but making models and illustrations. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, they had to be perfect or else. You know. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, it taught me to make them right. And <coughs> so I appreciated that, and I enjoyed her company. But I gradually heard that people said, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But a lot of it had to do with this stuff that Amherst College had. And nobody really knew what it was. It was just something that had gone wrong somewhere. Yeah. But she had a few friends, people who stuck up with her to the end for her, and Milton Zoffer was one of them. And he's the one that, that let me know. He was a professor of chemistry there, uh, and he's the one that said, you know about her story. He said, you're spending a lot of time with her. What do you know about her? And I said, nothing. Very nice lady. He said, oh, well, you should know. Um, and he told me some of this. And then most of it I found later after she left her papers to Smith, and then I found more things elsewhere. So she didn't talk about it. Any other questions? Do you, are there other scientists who are brilliant and cast their lot with the wrong idea and defend it? Are there others? Oh, many. Oh, oh, many. many. That, that are really peppering the, uh, the, uh, the you know, biographies and stuff? We well, know there's a book about, about, I forgot the name of it, unfortunately, but there is a book about scientists who got onto wrong theories and never let go. But a perfect example is Linus Pauling with vitamin C. Well, vitamin C, I know that one. But that yeah. was out of his field. That, that was out of his field, but the same thing. Field, but it was out of his field. It was out of his field, but he thought, no, this is a very good example of what yeah. she was like, because she would say, I know I'm not a chemist, but I'm a mathematician. Mathematics yeah. comes first. And Pauling's <laughs> argument was, I know I'm not a medical doctor or biologist, but I'm a chemist, and it's all chemistry, isn't it? And you know, vitamin C has to be what I say. He really was taking the same position in, in his own way as she did with the map uh, in the in biology. Uh, but, so he's a good example. But there are many others, yeah. and I've just forgotten. But sometimes it's very hard to let go of something. When you've done all the work and got you know, written papers and books about it, and you still believe it's right, it's very hard to let go of it. True for many people in most fields. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> this is not just a science. <laughs> <laughs> not just a 